Well, good evening. I'm Bernie Brady, Chair of the Theology Department here at St. Thomas. Thank you for coming this evening, and you're all very welcome to be here. Uh, I've had a lifelong conversation about and with Dorothy Day. When I, I had heard about her and talked to people who had worked with her when I was in college, if I had more of a Dorothy temperament, which I still do not possess, I would have gotten on a Greyhound from Chicago to New York and packed a jar of instant coffee with me and stopped in to see what I would see. Yet today, through my reading and discussing and arguing about and writing about and teaching, and there's been hardly a semester in the last four decades uh, that I've been teaching that I have not addressed her in my classroom, I have vibrant yet not sentimental images of her and her life, just the way I think she would like it. Her life is a challenge to me, marked as it is by a very complicated simplicity, captured in no better way for me than in the famous picture of her sitting on her little stool in the midst of the United Farm Workers March in California between two police officers, the holstered pistol of one and the nightstick of the other, symbols of violence and fear and misunderstanding frame the sincere, focused, and peaceful old woman. Dorothy's life, like I must admit the lives of many holy people, draws me in, but I know that I cannot completely hold on to it. But that is the point. She purposefully did not work to create clones. While never a stated purpose of her work, she did, however, run formation programs, sort of, for lay people, and a few clergy were trained by her as well. Seminaries of sorts, where lay people would take her Catholic worker into their lives and other worlds. The habits she wanted them to wear were internal. I am not one to hold on to back copies of magazines, but one that sits not far from my desk is the January 25th, 2013 copy of Commonweal with Dorothy on the cover and tonight's speaker, Patrick Jordan, on the byline. I am very grateful that he is here with us tonight. I must confess that, though, when the magazine came out, I thought, oh, does Common Wheel really need another article about Dorothy? Well, since I kept it so long, you know my answer. I hope not to steal Patrick's thunder here, but I'd like to introduce him with his words about Dorothy. In the concluding paragraphs of the article, he talks about the morning conversations he had with her. She had already had her coffee and prayed the Psalms, but was not yet ready to go downstairs to formally begin the day. He writes that they talked about a variety of things, and she would give him assignments and warnings and wisdom. It is because of the following words that I've held on to this magazine. Patrick continues, There would be spiritual direction often from Scripture. You must take up your cross daily. We are to forgive 70 times 7. Where there is no love, put love, and you will find love. We love God as much as we love the ones least. And pray. You must take up your cross daily. We are to forgive 70 times 7. There is no, where there is no love, put love, and you will find love. We love God as much as we love the one we love least. And pray. This leads us, he tells us, to a passionate, practical, and thoughtful faith. The only kind worthy of a living God. Friends, please welcome Patrick Jordan to St. Thomas and to this podium. Thank you, Dr. Brady. That's something. I'm certainly not a clone of Dorothy Day, so don't expect that. Um, and it's hard for one to live up to one's own words, as some of you may know by this time. I want to thank you for inviting me and my wife, Kathleen, to come here to St. Paul and to Saint, the University of St. Thomas. Lori Diamond has been a big help in arranging all of this, so we do want to thank her. And Anne Clement is here, who has done a great deal for uh, understanding Dorothy Day over many years and is continuing hard at work on it, so, and we are all the beneficiaries of it. I was here some years ago uh, when Deborah Ruddy was on the faculty and William Cavanaugh was on the faculty, and uh, it was, it was uh, a, a very lively time. Dorothy Day was, uh, as uh, 
we just heard, uh, uh, she, she would say her morning psalms, and they were very, very close to her. And since the subject for tonight is Dorothy Day, A Voice of Justice, I want to refer to several psalms. Justice shall march before God, and peace shall follow his steps. That's Psalm 85. And then to Isaiah, seek justice, rescue the oppressed, defend the orphan, plead for the widow. Zion will be redeemed by justice. We'll all be redeemed by justice. And then another psalm, Psalm 93. Holiness is fitting to your house, O Lord, until the end of time. This is the month of all saints. And Ray Samaritan, the wife of a great philosopher, wrote, I love the saints because they are lovable and sinners because they are like me. So it's a good thing to remember these things, both the saints and the sinners. And finally, from the Benedictus that the monks and, and others say every day, you swore to Abraham and Sarah that free from fear and saved from the hands of our foes, we might serve you in holiness and justice all the days of our life in your presence. So holiness and justice seem to go together, and from that can emerge a sense of being aware of God's presence, and with that, a gift of joy. Hopkins wrote that the just person justices, so it's not just a voice for justice, the just person acts for Justin. And then action is followed by peace, as we just heard in the psalm. Dorothy Day keeps turning up, as we just learned. And 37 years ago, uh, she uh, uh, passed away. And, but tomorrow would be her 120th birthday. Kate Hennessy, her, one of her grandchildren, has written a wonderful book, just been published this year, Dorothy Day, uh, Beauty Will Save the World. Last year, Albert Robito, who's a, uh, um, now he's emeritus theologian at Princeton, wrote a book about seven American prophets, and one of them was Dorothy Day. The year before that, David Brooks wrote his book called The Road to Character, and he has a whole chapter there about Dorothy Day. Krista Tippett, who uh, does things on National Public Radio about the life of the spirit, uh, she is in her book, Becoming Wise, mentions Dorothy a number of times. And of course, Pope Francis, at a joint session of Congress several years ago, mentioned Dorothy Day. Last year, there was a book published called The Penny Poet of Portsmouth, uh, uh, New Hampshire. And it's the story of a friendship between the author, Krista Tippett. I'm sorry, not Krista Tippett. It's uh, Kathleen Towler and her friendship with a poet who was called the Poet Laureate of Portsmouth, uh, Robert Dunn. Once they were having a conversation, and Dunn uh, said to Towler, I knew her, you know. Knew who? Kathleen Towler asked. Dorothy Day. You knew Dorothy Day? Yes, she was a formidable woman, as though that was all that was needed to be said by this poet. How did you know Dorothy Day, she asks. Well, I lived in New York. I spent a lot of time at the Catholic Worker. And when did you live in New York? Oh, that was in the 60s. I lived up near Columbia University. What did you do? I helped out on the soup line, the soup kitchen. I went down to the Bowery quite a bit. It was a rather rough part of town then. And finally, the question, well, what was Dorothy Day like? A force to be reckoned with. Another poet, New York poet, Ned O'Gorman, and an educator, said of Dorothy, she was one of the most sophisticated women I've ever met. She transcended class. She had a tremendous self-possession. 
and there was in her a radiant, transcendent authenticity. The historian Mel Peel, in his top drawer, History of the Catholic Worker, Breaking Bread, the Catholic Worker, and the Origins of Catholic Radicalism in America, described Dorothy Day this way. She was an engaging conversationalist and a careful listener. She had an extremely quick mind and retentive memory that served her well as a writer. She was a working journalist, but like few others in that field, she managed to combine an interest in hard facts and social institutions with a thoughtful sensitivity to the hidden meanings and subtle implications of human situations. Her strong reliance on fiction and drama as primary guides to the moral and spiritual universe accustomed her to looking at people with the attentive eye of the artist. In George Eliot's book, Middlemarch, he describes his heroine, Dorothea Brooke, this way. The effect of her being on others was incalculably diffuse. And I've had that experience giving talks sometimes about Dorothy, of hearing people stand up and talk, recount about their meeting with Dorothy Day. Maybe it was 50 years ago, whatever. Dorothy's granddaughter, Kate, says, to have known Dorothy means spending the rest of your life wondering what hit you. And to which Kathleen and I would add, and no doubt Kate would agree, with gratitude for that encounter. Kathleen and I got to know Dorothy during the last 13 years of her life. She was somebody uh, you felt was at ease with herself. And uh, usually she was usually she, she was a very approachable. She, in a sense, because she had a, a, a certain name and aura about her, she was also, because of this ease, quite disarming. You really enjoyed being with her. And she was an appreciative sort of person. She paid attention. She had herself a sense of presence. And she made you feel welcomed. And not just me as a young person, but all sorts of other visitors who came in through the door of the House of Hospitality in New York. And of course, people that she met uh, giving talks all around the country. She also had a sense of irony, which would appear in some of her writing. And at times that could lead to a sense of paradox. <coughs> she was not always predictable, but she was a radical Christian, rooted always in the Gospels. Pope Francis writes in one of his recent encyclicals, conversion demands that we review all the aspects of our life related to the social order and the common good. Pretty challenging. This is a basic Catholic social teaching. And then he goes on, there is a need to resolve the structural problems of poverty that cannot be delayed. So this is a time when we are called to go to work and put up our sleeves and do something about it. Dorothy Day wrote, uh, led a fascinating life and she wrote a lot of fascinating things too. She was uh, born in Brooklyn. She's a quintessential American in the sense that she has people going back some to the Revolutionary War and others two sides of the Civil War. She was born in Brooklyn, moved right before the San Francisco earthquake about 1905, was living in San Francisco or in the Bay Area with her family and experienced that. After that, the family lost their livelihood and so moved to Chicago. She spent her teen years there, then went off to uh, the University of Illinois, spent two years there, and then moved back to New York because her family was moving back. She only spent two years in college. Um, later on, she would live in New Orleans and travel to Canada, Mexico, Europe, Russia, Calcutta, Australia, Hong Kong, Africa, Cuba, 
But one place she didn't get was the Holy Land. She said she had an offer when she was in Rome during the Vatican Council to go to the Holy Land, but instead she decided to go visit the poor in Sicily with Danilo Dolci. So her, that was her priority. She moved to New York, as I said, uh, with her family in 1916, and she was 19 years of age. Her father was a newspaper man. I should show you a few more pictures here. Okay, I was going the wrong way. This is Dorothy in the middle with her two older brothers. They both became uh, newspaper uh, people as well. Dorothy with her younger sister, Della, in Chicago in their teens. They used to walk all over Chicago, and Dorothy got a real sense and loved Chicago, the, the different parts of the city, uh, the, the, ba the very different ethnic areas, and going into the poor areas, the stockyards, and that sort of thing. She was reading Upton Sinclair and uh, uh, following what was going on in the city at that time. Here she is at the age of 19 in 1916, and she wanted to get a, a job as a journalist, and her father uh, didn't want any women in, in, in the newsroom. So she had to go out on her own, and she ended up getting a job with a socialist paper, The Call. And this is a picture of her at that, that time. This is, the, this is the next year. Her picture's not here, but this was the suffragist uh, at uh, the White House. And uh, she worked for The Call, as I said, and also another journal called The Masses. And she was a, a reporter and also a features writer. So she uh, de demonstrated against World War I before it started. She appeared in support of the suffragists. She never, she was an anarchist. She felt uh, uh, people should, should do things uh, without, uh, on a much more local level, and everyone should take responsibility at more local levels. So in terms of voting for candidates who seemed far away. That was never what she did, and from what I understand, she, she never did cast a vote, although she was a left, uh, uh, arrested supporting the suffragists because she said she thought they were being made political prisoners for their beliefs. And she was thrown into jail and uh, had a 30-day sentence and got into some scuffles with the police while she was in jail. Um, started and joined a, a hunger fast while she was in jail. And um, really, uh, after the hunger fast began, she became uh, depressed. So she asked, and she knew it was the only book she could get on request, for a Bible. And she started to read the Bible, and especially the Psalms. She had uh, her, she'd been baptized an Episcopalian as a teenager, I think, never practiced that became, she thought, an atheist when she was in college. So here she is in jail. She gets the Psalms, and she starts reading them. And the Psalms, uh, even though her conversion to Catholicism wouldn't come until many years later, uh, the Psalms were always a companion to her. She fasted, as I said, and then eventually President Wilson um, exonerated the, uh, the, the uh, suffragists. And eventually, of course, that became uh, a constitutional amendment. So that's, uh, Dorothy's arrest was 100 years ago right now, on, on the 10th of November, and she was 20 years old. When she came back, instead of living in the East Village amongst a lot of refugees, she came back to New York and lived for a period in Greenwich Village, the real artistic center, and became friends with a number of famous uh, and great poets and uh, playwrights. And uh, this was a time, as I said, in preparation for the First World War, and she was demonstrating against the First World War. Um, a good friend of her, not a real good friend, but a friend of hers overdosed in, in a, um, one of the bars where she was in Manhattan and uh, ended up dying in her arms. And then another friend who was a CO, he was carted off to the uh, military jail 
and basically murdered there in New Jersey. And these two things uh, really affected Dorothy, the, these deaths. So for a while, she left Greenwich Village and she went to Brooklyn to Kings County Hospital and she studied nursing. And she was there during the great flu epidemic and talked about seeing the cadavers brought down so that the hallways were filled every morning with those who had died. It was also about this time that she fell madly in love with a newspaper reporter, um, gave up the nursing course, went to live with him, uh, conceived a child. In order to uh, save their relationship, had, an had the child aborted. The man left her anyway, but it had a profound effect on Dorothy. And as a result, she entered into a rebound marriage of a fairly wealthy publicist, and the two of them went off to Europe for a year. And while she was in Europe, she wrote a novel, basically a somewhat autobiographical novel uh, about uh, a woman who has an abortion. She returned at the end of the year to New York with the novel complete, but the uh, marriage uh, dissolved, and she felt she had really been dishonest with the man that she had fled with. So she returned all the stuff, and then basically she went off to Chicago looking for her former lover, but that still didn't work out. So she's a woman who, who is trying different things and searching. Eventually, her novel, the movie rights were sold for it, and she got a bonus and was able to buy a cottage on Staten Island. And it was there that she met the, the, the real love of her life, a man named Foster Batterham, who uh, was also uh, like her from the leftist side of things and an anarchist. But they really fell in love. And uh, let's see if I have a picture here of Foster. There they are on the beach in Staten Island, not far from where Dorothy's cottage was. And she writes beautifully about this in her wonderful autobiography, The Long Loneliness, and in a section called Natural Happiness. He was a bit of a biologist and taught her all about sea life. They go out in the boat, catch uh, eels, uh, bring them in, go clamming, that sort of thing. They had an, an ideal um, relationship, it seemed. And then she conceived again. She thought she would not be able to have another child after the abortion. And when her daughter, their daughter, was born in 1926, she had this sort of epiphany of gratitude uh, and felt that to whom could she show and really have a sense that all of this was due to. And that led to her real sense of the divine. And with that, also a sense that she had to care for this child, and she wanted to bring this child up as a Catholic. She had been going occasionally when she was in Greenwich Village and then later in New Orleans into Catholic churches. She wasn't quite sure why. And a communist had given her a rosary, and she started praying the rosary even though she didn't know how it worked. Uh, and as I said, the Psalms were there for her at times as well. So unfortunately, this led to a real break between her common-law husband, Forster, and Dorothy. Because Forster, she wanted Forster to marry her. Uh, he did not have to become a Catholic or a Christian or anything, but she did want to have a, a real marriage so that their, their family would be a whole family. And Forster would, just would not agree to that. He's a very strong-willed person, just as, as Dorothy was. And um, eventually, they grew further and further apart, and then he, and uh, Dorothy sort of barred the door. She had Tamar uh, baptized a bit before that, and then a year and a half later, after trying to bring Foster along, uh, she was baptized herself. And um, Forster sort of went his way. There were some backs and forth and that sort of thing, but. By and large, Dorothy, as a young Catholic now, was struggling to live by the teachings of the church. She was basically now a single mother and was supporting 
by and large, she was the one who was supporting Tamar, although Forster really did pitch in as well. And um, after she became a Catholic, she started writing some for Catholic magazines, Catholic publications, and also continued writing for leftist magazines as well, and uh, in order to be able to provide for her family. In uh, about 1928, she was doing some music, uh, some uh, movie scripts for MGM, and the following year, she and Tamar, Tamar would have been about a little bit over three years old then, uh, picked up and went to Hollywood, where Dorothy had been given a job to write scripts at a movie studio there. And uh, that didn't last too long. Dorothy did teach herself to drive at that point. And then when the movie contract was over, she and Tamar headed for Mexico. And they lived in Mexico for, for some time. And um, uh, Dorothy writes beautifully of the times in Mexico with her daughter, uh, uh, meeting Diego Rivera, going to the shrine of Our Lady of Guadalupe, and things like that. And she was sending these uh, writings back to Catholic magazines here in the States. Tamar got malaria in Mexico, and they had to return to this country. And back here, she continued, Dorothy continued to work at various jobs, writing, but also doing retail and working for various peace groups and that sort of thing. In 1932, some communist friends, this is still the Herbert Hoover era, had organized a great hunger march uh, in December of 1932 in Washington, D.C., and uh, Dorothy went down to cover that for several magazines. And while she was there, she had this experience of being a journalist on the sidelines, wishing that she could also be a part of what the protesters were doing, but also wondering where Catholics were in all of this. Uh, how come the communists were organizing these things and the poor were not getting any help from her co-religionists? So she went to the great national shrine there in Washington, D.C., and she prayed that she would be shown some way to put together her radical disposition and her Catholicism. And when she got back to uh, New York, where she was living, uh, she, a man had come to meet her. His name was Peter Morin. Peter Morin, and we'll talk about him in just a minute, was uh, a Christian from France, who basically was an itinerant uh, preacher and understood Catholic social teaching probably better than, than most uh, uh, theologians at the time. Dorothy's friend, Nina Paulson Moore, said that I am always startled by the fact that Dorothy came to Catholicism as a convert and came with this vast bedrock of the importance and dignity of human persons and this great sense of revolution for the world, that it is not what it must be. And she was able to translate these surging feelings and this thirst for justice into a Catholic tradition. A laywoman, a, a single laywoman, she had a profound influence on our, on our thought, or should have a profound influence on our thought. Peter Moore in this... Uh, uh, uh. Oh, there's Dorothy, um, probably the year before uh, Tamara was born in front of her cottage. And you can see that she is a woman in love. There's Dorothy with Tamar uh, in the year of Tamar's birth. The artist Fritz Eichenberg, a great uh, wood engraver, did this for Dorothy's autobiography of uh, Dorothy and Tamar at the beach there on Staten Island. And here's Dorothy with Tamar. This picture was taken by uh, Tamar's father, Foster. And Dorothy and Tamar, uh, about the time we've just been talking about. Well, this is the chap that shows up at her door. He was 20 years her senior, uh, a personalist uh, influenced by Emmanuel Mounier in France. And he wanted a radical change from a society of what he called go-getters to a society of go-givers. He wrote these essays, and this is one. Modern society has made the bank account 
the standard of values. And when the bank account becomes the standard of values, the banker has the power. And when the banker has the power, we have an acquisitive society, not a functional society. I want a change and a radical change. I want a change from an acquisitive society to a functional society, that means one working for the common good, from a society of go-getters to a society of go-getters, givers. The two pillars that Peter based the Catholic Worker Movement on were from Matthew's Gospel, the Sermon on the Mount and the Last Judgment scene. And these undercut the basic materialism of Western capitalism, the violence they, that maintains it, and also the materialism that, that shuts out the spiritual dimension in life. So what Peter wanted to do was to bring the corporal, the famous Catholic corporal and spiritual works of mercy, opposed to the works of war, the opposite of them, and practice them on a daily basis. Dorothy wrote, we consider the spiritual and corporal works of mercy and the following of Christ to be the best revolutionary technique and the means for changing the social order rather than perpetuating it. We are saying, and we're trying to say with action, Dorothy wrote, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We are working for a Christian social order. And so the historian Mel Peel in his book says that this is the first significant expression of Catholic radicalism in the United States. All of this is tied in also with the liturgy, what Peter Morin called the primacy of the spiritual and from early on in 1934, Peter Moore and Dorothy Day were in touch with the Benedictines out here at St. John's Abbey. As Dorothy wrote to Abbot Alquin Deutsch, we have been trying from the start of our work to link up the liturgy with the church's social doctrine, realizing that the doctrine of the mystical body of Christ is at the root of both. And Professor Kavanaugh has written, with the authority of scripture and the church fathers behind her, Dorothy Day resolutely drew out the consistent implications of the doctrine of the mystical body of Christ for human action, refusing to separate the spiritual from the rest of life and death, and refusing to acknowledge a separate sphere of hegemony for the nation state. For Dorothy Day, the mystical body of Christ, he continued, was concrete. It was found in the personhood of ourselves and of one another. So how did Dorothy Day and the Catholic Worker and the Catholic Worker paper become not simply a voice for justice, but a community doing justice? Well, first of all, it opened houses of hospitality, places of welcome, most often in very dire sites in cities. This was the Depression where people could come and find some warmth, some food, and some welcome. And in order to welcome people into these places and make them feel welcome, you had to be poor yourself. So when people joined the Catholic Worker, there were no salaries, there were no benefits. You all shared uh, in the same food, uh, often uh, got your clothes from the clothing room when, when clothes were brought. It was all done with a spirit of personalism, trying to see Christ in each one. And that means you must have patience, great patience. And so all sorts of people would show up. Uh, the paper uh, was the next thing. They published a paper, The Catholic Worker. And uh, with this Catholic Worker paper, they were talking about house of hospitality. So people started showing up at the editorial office and taking up space in the editorial office. There were evidently two guys, Dolan and Egan, and they would come in. Peter Morin had met them in the, um, I guess maybe at Union Square, 
which was a hotbed of uh, radical discussion. And they came down to the work and, and sort of would take their place there. And this sometimes for Dorothy, who was trying to get out the paper, was very difficult. And in order to uh, give her the elbow, sometimes people would say, uh, Dolan and Egan are here. You know, it was going to take away her sense of being able to concentrate. You find this still, all these great stories in the Catholic worker about people who came in and spent the rest of their life, life there working with the volunteers, being cared for, and eventually buried by the Catholic worker. And this is all still going on in a variety of places in Minnesota, in Iowa, in New York, across the country. Peter wanted to call this newspaper the Catholic Radical. Dorothy held out for the Catholic worker. This was a time of trying to organize workers in the United States. And the Catholic Church, it turned out, be, uh, became very strong with this, defending the rights of workers to organize. And when the Catholic Worker paper came out, uh, exemplifying that and giving uh, people a certain direction uh, right from daily life, the whole thing just sort of took off. The earliest issues had to do with, with uh, of this paper, it's a little tabloid paper, eight pages usually, um, there are some copies in the back of the most recent issue of The Catholic Worker, and you're welcome to pick them up or outside when you're leaving. Um, the paper cost a penny a copy then, and it still does today. And the idea was so that people felt that they could contribute something and yet be able to get the paper. The earliest issues dealt with things like the Scottsboro Boys, nine Alabama blacks who were accused of raping a white woman and were threatened with execution. Right away, the Catholic worker supported the creation of Catholic interracial councils, and it decried Catholic failures on integration. We have sinned exceedingly, an editorial said, about the lack of integration in Catholic institutions. In Chicago, a gentleman named Arthur G. Falls, he was a Catholic doctor in Chicago and the chairman of the Urban League's Interracial Commission in Chicago, a black man. He wrote Dorothy early on that he was struck with wonder at the Catholic worker paper. Those who have labored with Catholics, both clergy and laity, in an effort to face practical issues are more than joyful to see your publication. And then he said, it would be interesting to see, at that time on the masthead, there were two workmen on either side of the phrase Catholic worker. One was carrying a pick and the other was carrying a shovel. Both were white, similar to some of the communist papers that were published. So Arthur Fall said, uh, it would be interesting to see one of those workmen at the top of your front page shown to be a colored workman. And that happened uh, immediately. Later on, and I'll show you uh, uh, the... the um, there's Dorothy about this time. These are the Catholic workers early on, uh, 1935. Peter Morin in the middle, Tamar's daughter, uh, Dorothy to his left, uh, and Dorothy right behind uh, Tamar. And this woman here on, on the front row, uh, second from the, from the uh, would be your right, um, is Adi Bethune, and she was a young artist uh, from a Belgian background, came to the worker and Dorothy put her to work, and she's the one that designed what became the traditional uh, Catholic worker logo. She said, why not have Christ uniting the workers? Pretty, pretty brilliant and telling thing, you know, that's exactly it. And then some years later, uh, that was transformed into a uh, a farm worker woman with a child joined with the other worker in, in Christ. <clears throat> Falls uh, founded the Catholic Worker House in Chicago on Taylor Street, and it was really a place for discussions, which was a big part of the Catholic Worker. And um, 
One of the people who came to that house was a man named Ed Marciniak. He was the son of a Polish immigrant, a steel worker. And he was later called uh, in uh, an article about him, the Chicago Dynamo. He worked in the labor field for many years. And Ed Marciniak said, I discovered through the Catholic worker a church I had never heard about, never knew existed. And all of a sudden, there was this new world for me, a world of great intellectual vitality. And we raised every question. We challenged every conceivable position. We subjected the church to so much scrutiny because we loved her so much. And sometimes our sessions would go from Sunday afternoon right through to early Monday morning. One week we'd be discussing Jacques Maritain, the next week the steel strike. In 1937, Dorothy visited Chicago, and when she got there, she didn't think this particular house that was having discussions was doing enough. She said you, and so she encouraged Marciniak to open a house, and that became the Blue Island House. And for many years, Chicago had a Catholic worker house, right up into the Second World War. And then years later, the Catholic workers started different houses in them. In 1934, so just about this time, the Catholic workers started a house in Harlem. And they were pushed out of the store, according to Dorothy, not because of racism, but the owner didn't agree with our pacifism. He thought we were subversive. And pacifism is subversive. In 1933, the year the workers started publishing, they had sent representatives to what was called the United States Congress Against War. And in 1936, they started supporting Catholic conscientious objectors. And by 1940, they helped form the Association of Catholic Conscientious Objectors. Dorothy even testified before Congress about this. Another issue that came right at the start was anti-Semitism, addressing that. This was 1933. Hitler had just come in. And very soon, the Catholic worker was picketing the German consulate in downtown New York. In 1935, they picketed a German liner that had come into the city, the Bremen. All this time, they were also supporting uh, people who were trying to form unions for the National Biscuit Company strike, the Borden Milk Company strike in 1936. And then Dorothy went south in 36 and visited the, the tenant, tenant farmers union, poor people trying to create a union of tenant farms. She uh, was in Tennessee and somehow sparked. She wrote off to Eleanor Roosevelt and said how terrible the situation was down there in Tennessee and Arkansas. And the governor of Arkansas was fit to be tied and called her uh, a New York meddler. This was at the same time that the seamen strike uh, was happening in New York along the docks and trying to form a union there. And the Catholic worker became uh, a real hub for welcoming strikers. In 1937, they were off, Dorothy was off to the Fisher body plant in Flint, Michigan to join with the workers. And at the same time, a young a Catholic who had come to the uh, reporter who had come to the Catholic worker from Boston. He was a graduate of Harvard. He, John Court was his name. He started the Association of Catholic Trade Unionists, a group of Catholics involved in the, in the trade unions, and it lasted for many years and had a salutary effect. And then at about the same time, the Spanish Civil War was starting, and the Catholic worker took a neutral position, a pacifist position, did not support the Franco regime or Franco revolutionists who were supported by and large by the Catholic Church, both in Spain and here. And the Catholic worker came under fire from many uh, uh, conservative Catholics for having broken with the um, hierarchy on this. He continued to take on the anti-Semitism problem with another Catholic, a Father Coglin, who had a journal Social Justice, so that all these things are going back and forth, very dynamic time. And in 1939, Dorothy helped to found the Committee of Catholics to fight against anti-Semitism. And that same year, she wrote of racism in both uh, Washington, D.C. and Harrisburg for Commonweal Magazine. Soon after, she started uh, going to uh, retreats 
a, a very um, um, uh, like a, a weak retreat, a silent retreat that was very demanding and became very controversial in, in, in the Catholic worker history. 1941 comes along and the bombing of Pearl Harbor and the Catholic worker said, uh, we do not, we will not support the war. And Dorothy thought that the paper would be suppressed because things she had worked for in the First World War had been suppressed when you didn't support the war. Fortunately, it was not suppressed by the government. She immediately started going around the country, and when she got to the far west coast, she's one of the first people to really write about the Japanese Americans who were interred in uh, camps out in California and Oregon and Washington State. And she uh, uh, got some nasty letters from the government for some of the things she wrote about that. And then in 1945, uh, she wrote a very strong condemnation of nuclear weapons with the dropping of the bomb at Hiroshima. This is just the antithesis of loving our enemies. But you can look this up. It's, it's, a, it's a, a very fine piece and coming out right after the bombing. In 1949, she took on the Archdiocese of New York by supporting the Cardinal Spellman's cemetery, uh, breaking a cemetery uh, strike. People who, the grave diggers, went on strike, and the Cardinal uh, broke the strike by uh, bringing the seminarians in to dig the graves. So Dorothy was on uh, the, the right side in terms of history on that, the wrong side in terms of her local ordinary. And then, of course, began, came the... the uh, Korean War, the Cold War, air raid drills that were conducted every year in New York so that people would run down into the subways and to shelters. And this all became part of war games and acclimatized people to think, oh, uh, nuclear war might be okay. Some of us will, will survive. You know? So uh, the Catholic workers started protesting these. They wouldn't go down. they get sentenced to jail year in and year out, sometimes 30-day sentences. Eventually, after about 10 years, the uh, city of New York called off these drills. In 1955, she writes somewhere that she was here in St. Paul, and she visited a church. She said it was painted blue. It was for Our Lady of Guadalupe. And she said she had a feeling of a much-loved place. In 1954, the year before that, she had written an article for the Catholic worker on Theophane Venard. He had been a French missionary in Indochina and Ho Chi Minh. And in that article, 1954, she warned the United States that it should not get into a war in Indochina. In 1957, she was shot at while uh, witnessing uh, at an integrated community in Koinonia, uh, Georgia. She was not struck, but it was a terrifying experience for her. In 1960, these are just fragments, but when you read more about her, you can put some of these together. She wrote to readers of The Catholic Worker that she was returning over $3,000 in an interest payment that had come from the city of New York for a property The Catholic Worker had that had been condemned. The property, I think they gave them $68,000 for, but they also later tried to give them a check for the back interest. And Dorothy refused that on principle because she felt that taking interest was actually stealing from those who, who needed that money more than the people that were lending the money. She got a lot of flack for that. People said you could have used that money for the poor. She said, no, the principle is what's important here. In 1962, she journeyed to Cuba, wrote about that in The Catholic Worker. Um, uh, uh, some of that was quite controversial. She went uh, not to legitimize the Cuban government, although she, she thought that people had a, a right to stand up and uh, revolt if, if things were, were too bad, and that seemed to be the case in Cuba. And the popes would come to agree with that. that uh, but um, she was there right before the Cuban Missile Crisis, and so some of the hubbub created by her columns uh, was superseded by the severity of this particular crisis. In 
She was very happy when Pope John Paul II flew over Cuba at one point on the way to Mexico and blessed Cuba and blessed Fidel Castro. And when she was in Cuba, she stayed with the common people. She said she was able to get to mass every day and go to various parts of the island. In 1963, 65, and 67, she went to Rome, first to, uh, to support uh, Pachamenteras, John uh, XXIII's great encyclical about peace, then to help, um, uh, she fasted for 10 days in 1965 to help make the council fathers aware of the necessity for a condemnation of nuclear warfare and to recognize conscientious objectors. Both of those were incorporated into council documents. It's the only condemnation that the council, the Second Vatican Council, made. And then in 1967, she was asked to be a representative uh, and to represent the United States at a conference on the laity and she was invited by the Pope to receive uh, communion. She came back and, and traveled a lot. Can't go into all of that. She printed Julius Nereri in The Catholic Worker, who was the socialist president of Tanzania, a Catholic. Um, she started going out and supporting the farm workers, and she was uh, arrested uh, with, with the farm workers in 1973. This is Dorothy back in the 1940s, I think. Her granddaughter, Kate, looks very much like her. This is uh, Dorothy's daughter, Kate's mother, Tamar, at one of the Catholic worker farms. Dorothy and several of her grandchildren, more of her grandchildren. Um, Tamar had nine children. And this is Tamar uh, several years before she died. She lived to be 82. These are some of Adi Bethune's drawings for the Catholic worker, very strong woodcuts. Fritz Eichenberg's famous uh, portrait of Jesus in the bread line. And Jesus at table where we share bread and Christ is present when we do. Powerful um, during the civil rights era. Two different St. Francis's, one by Fritz Eichenberg, the other by uh, Rita Corbin, a, a, a very gifted Catholic worker artist. This is Dorothy in the 50s at one of the Catholic worker farms, I think. Dorothy protesting in those protests I had mentioned before. <coughs> Excuse me. Down by City Hall Park. Dorothy with the actress Judith Molina, who was protesting with her. They both spent a good time in jail together. She writes about it in the Commonweal magazine. Dorothy a few years later. Dorothy in the 70s, I think. No, oh, maybe this is the 60s. This is at 175 Christie Street House, I think. In the 70s at the Tivoli Farm. And one of the people who ran the farm there, Marge Hughes. Dorothy, I think this is probably in the 70s. It was taken in Milwaukee when she was up there talking one time at the Catholic Worker Farm at Tivoli at the same, about the same year. Dorothy and others praying the evening prayer at um, uh, First Street, St. Joseph House. A graffiti on the wall not far from the Catholic Worker. Still, um, uh, uh, still valid today, I suppose. Talking with, or me talking with her. She talking with, um, Daniel Berrigan, when he got out of prison one time, he came down and said mass at the soup kitchen there. Here's the photo we were talking about before. One of them are like it in, in, in uh, uh, when she was protesting with the farm workers in 1973 in California. This is this uh, iconic photograph by uh, Bob Fitch. When she was in prison there, uh, all of her cellmates uh, uh, signed her, uh, her smock, see Viva La Causa, on the one side. And, then, and she wasn't supposed to bring that out with her, but she told the, the uh, warden that she was going to, and she did. Here she is with Mother Teresa several years before uh, she died. This is at Mary House. She had met Mother Teresa in India. This is Eileen Egan, 
who was a, a really helped to introduce Mother Teresa to the United States. She worked with Catholic Relief Services and was also an editor of the Catholic Worker and traveled with Dorothy in uh, many different parts of the world. This was a very good and devoted friend of Dorothy, Frank Donovan, who was basically like her secretary and, and uh, watched over her in the last 10 years of her life. You can see there's a oxygen uh, tank there to help her. She had uh, severe heart problems. These are just a few artistic uh, representations of Dorothy that have sprung up. This is uh, Dorothy uh, later on uh, um, on Staten Island. This is, no, this is actually in Ohio with our daughter, Hannah. And uh, this is on Staten Island with our daughter, Hannah. So I've given you here just a dusting of some of the positions the Catholic Worker Paper has taken and also some of the things that, that Dorothy was involved it, with. The point was to build bridges and uh, uh, not to be denouncers but announcers. Meanwhile, the saga of the Catholic Worker houses and farms all continue and all those years they're described in some uh, part in Kate's new book, The Daily Experience of Poverty in New York, The Mass, The Church. My feeling, wrote Dorothy, that the church is Christ on earth, and that's my joy and my delight and my solace. All these things, and I'd like to end here just in a second, remind me of something that St. Augustine wrote. Uh, hundreds and hundreds of years before when he did, was describing his own daily work as a bishop in a small African uh, place. And Augustine says, the turbulent must be corrected, the faint-hearted cheered up, the weak supported, the gospel's opponents need to be refuted, the unlearned need to be taught, the indolent need to be stirred up, the argumentative, they need to be checked. The proud must be put in their place and the desperate set on their feet. Those engaged in quarrels must be reconciled. The needy have to be helped, the oppressed to be liberated, the good to be encouraged, the bad to be tolerated, and all must be loved. And I think that's a fine description of Dorothy Day and how she lived and practiced her life. George Eliot uh, uh, in Middlemarch writes of that same character, Dorothea Brooke, she was someone who widened the skirts of light and made the struggle with darkness narrower. She was a formidable woman, a force to be reconciled with. As ta Coates says in his book, Between the world and me, writing to his son, I would have you be a conscious citizen of this terrible and beautiful world. And Dorothy always tried to point out the beauty amidst all of the terrible things that were going on in our world. Thank you, and if you have questions or want to discuss any of this, please go ahead. Um, so that's our, our daughter. This is uh, Dorothy holding our son. And this is Dorothy's grave on Staten Island. Very simple. And uh, another photo of Dorothy. When you leave, there are some um, brochures and all out, out there for your taking out in the vestibule. There is a petition, uh, if you're at all interested in signing it, that Dorothy Day be considered for canonization. And the group that puts that out is the Dorothy Day Guild. There's a newsletter there if you'd like to read that and take it off. Also some 
holy cards about that and uh, copies of the Catholic Worker as well. Thank you very much for coming and spending your time this evening. We do have one okay. here. Okay. How did, how did you get involved with Dorothy Day? Um, I had been studying with the Franciscans in California. They had been uh, very closely associated with the Farm Workers Union. And Dorothy uh, was coming out to California, not just that year that uh, you saw her arrested, but a number of years before that. And um, I, I was looking for something to do in the summer and had some friends and they said, why don't you go to the Catholic worker in New York? And um, I contacted a woman who was associated with the Catholic worker and she said, oh yes, just go. You know? So I just went. And when I got to New York, I um, I'd only been to New York once before in my life. And so uh, I called up the Catholic worker on the phone and uh, Dorothy answered, and she said, oh, well, come down, you know. And so I got a cab down, because I had been in Midtown, and I didn't know the subways at that point, and uh, the cab driver, the Lower East Side was really uh, um, uh, like a, an area that was being burnt out at that time. Um, very tough, tough years, the late 60s. And uh, when I was about to get out of the cab, the cab driver says, are you sure? you want me to let you out here? <laughs> and um, went in, and Dorothy was sitting there. It was the new house, St. Joseph House. It wasn't open yet. And uh, she was sitting at a, a desk. That was the only piece of furniture in the place. And she was waiting for a contractor to come and uh, do some work in renovating this house that they had been able to buy. Uh, they were, that one house I mentioned that they had, um, had been condemned and they'd gotten some money for, um, they hadn't been able to purchase another place since then. They were able to purchase this house. This was 1968. I think they may have purchased it in 67, and it took a long time to, to get it renovated and that sort of thing. Anyway, she was there waiting for a contractor, and um, she, there were two young war resistors, conscientious objectors, who were there talking with her. And uh, right away, she introduced me to them, and then she picked up, uh, we had some mutual friends, but the Franciscans in California started asking me about them. And then before too long, I said, well, take your bag and go over to uh, the Catholic worker. We, ha we have a couple of apartments and uh, find a place there and then put your bag down and then go back to the uh, Christie Street house, 175 Christie Street. And it was really a dump. It was, uh, I thought the place was going to, cave in. You know, the second floor was uh, uh, where the newspapers were all stacked. The first floor was the uh, soup kitchen. And the third floor, I think that was like the stencil office and maybe the editorial offices up there. Well, it was, it was really a place that, uh, thank goodness, it didn't fall down on anybody before they got, got out of there. And that whole area now has been remarkably transformed. It's become somewhat trendy. Uh, uh, but um, at that time, it was pretty rough. And then um, Dorothy just had you um, get involved with the work. And it was, for me, uh, coming from, uh, I had been in the seminary a number of years, it was really quite an eye-opener and a challenge, uh, a physical and emotional challenge, because all of a sudden, I was th thrown in out of a very ordered life into a, a life of bedlam. <laughs> <You know? laughs> The Christie Street house was just a half a block away from the Bowery, a block away. The Bowery ran parallel to the Christie Street house. And uh, most of the people on the Bowery at that time were alcoholics or drug addicts. And it was the beginning of, of an age where drugs were starting to really, there had been a certain camaraderie amongst the alcoholics on the Bowery. With the drugs, this became something different almost like, I guess, what the United States is experiencing today, just this horrendous change, uh, and all sorts of people are swept up into this uh, 
uh, uh, addictive process, and it affects everybody in their lives, everybody they're associated with. Right? So at any rate, the, uh, there was a great deal of violence going on at that time. Um, the Catholic worker had been the f really the first to protest against the Vietnam War. Uh, Catholic workers had burned their draft cards, were the first to be imprisoned for destroying their draft cards. Um, the Catholic uh, uh, workers supported them, also called for people to resist paying war taxes. Uh, so, so it was, it was uh, quite uh, a demanding and challenging time to be there. And I, was, I came from a Franciscan background, so there certainly was a, a peace witness to it. But in, in terms of uh, uh, d dealing with this in our current situation and facing it, and then trying to make life decisions on that, this was a whole new ball game for me. Eventually, I had left the Franciscans and became a draft refuser myself. So, so uh, people at that time, their lives were, were really affected by uh, these historic changes. Um, and then one day, Dorothy says to me, you'll go to the press tomorrow and put out the paper. Well, I had done a little writing and, and stuff like in college and high school, I guess. Um, but at any rate, so I ended up uh, going up to the printers. The, the Catholic Worker paper was printed on a newsprint, as it still is today, and it used these uh, woodblock cuts. You know? And uh, I remember the first time we came back from the printers, and about a week later, um, the printer would send down what was called over matter. This was all linotype. It's nothing like we have, have today. Everything had to be typed up. It went to the printer. The printer linotyped it. And then you had to correct all that. You go back to the printer. Each little letter that was incorrect had to come out of this big, like, steel case, you know. The printer would grab a, uh, uh, an A or an E or something from some drawer and put that in, you know. And it's all backwards, you know, so, uh, so th then you're reading these things. Well, um, after the issue went out, you would get uh, proofs, and then a day or so later, the paper would be delivered, 90,000 papers. And they all had to be folded um, in half. They, they came in bundles that were big like this, big bundles. And we'd get them upstairs, and people would start to fold them. And this was great work for many of the people. It was the only type of work that they were able to contribute to the Catholic worker. And Dorothy really felt this was so important, you know, and never tried to take away any work from somebody who was trying to do work. You know? um, but anyway, I was going to tell the story, and that was that uh, about maybe a couple weeks later, you get back from the printer these long galleys is what's called over matter, you know. And uh, so there maybe are letters there that you hadn't been able to fit in or maybe a story that was going to go in next month. And <clears throat> here's a column, and it's, uh, it's the last third of an article by Dom Helder Camera that we had just printed. And we were such greenhorns that we had left out the last third <laughs> of the article. The next month, we simply said, a continuation of an article that began last month. You know, well, that's the way I learned, you know, and, and that sort of thing. And as I say, it was an extremely, we, we used to joke well, once we had left the Catholic worker, um, was there life after the Catholic worker? Because it was simply too engaging intellectually, spiritually, uh, materially, um, the, the issues that came up every day facing you right through the doorway uh, and really challenged you. It was, Dorothy called it a school, it really was a school of nonviolence where you learned to overcome your fear. And really fear is what's the, what stokes violence. So if we can learn better to deal with our fear um, is one of the chief things we, we, we have to do, you know, overcome our own fear. Thank you for asking that. <clears throat> Only at certain times. Dorothy was, Dorothy felt that if you were going to do this work and continue this, continue out this work, you had to try to get to Mass every day. 
But that was something that she said, we hoped we could convince people to do that. She, was, she very much uh, let people make their decisions in conscience what they should do. But for her, that was, that was, she once said, that's the most important work of the day, the Mass. If I can do that, if I can just do that right, everything else will follow. So that was really good advice uh, for some of us. Some others just, you know, they, they just chuck that off and, you know, and that sort of thing. Um, but for me, it's always been a, 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 a great help to have been instructed in that. Also, one of the things Dorothy learned through the Benedictines and that was the recitation of parts of the office. And so usually there was a, a part of the office every day, you know. And when we were there, um, uh, we, we sort of got going again in the house at St. Joseph House, a mass once a week in the house. And that's helped, has really helped to, to create a, a certain atmosphere there. There was never any preaching of religion at the Catholic Worker. There's a cross on the wall, but no one ever was, you didn't have to sing for your meal, you know, or pray for your meal or anything. There was no, Dorothy was very clear about that, you know. Um, God will do these things if, if that's what's desired, you know. And I, I, I would say, um, I mean, Dorothy introduced Kathleen and me to so many different spiritual writers, uh, classics, and even some contemporary, and I'm still trying to catch up with them. <laughs> I'm not doing too well with the more modern, the more recent people in a way. Some of them are so fruitful and all. Uh, Baron von Hugo, uh, you know, we were talking just a little bit a bit ago about Sigrid Unset and her great novels. You know, they have a Dorothy felt that reading could be prayer. You know, and writing could be prayer too. Uh, uh, and you you would see that in her writing because there was such attention put to it, and there was such depth in it. You know, uh, yes. Yeah, so she encouraged us, but she would never compel anybody. Yeah. Thank you for asking. Could I talk about Dorothy Day being in Rome? You spoke about Dorothy Day being yes. in Rome for the Second Vatican Council. Yes. Can you tell us more about her experience at the Second Vatican Council? Well, the first time she was there was in 1963, and it was between the first and second sessions. She went with a whole group of, of uh, women from around the world who had come after Pachamenteris was published to uh, su basically support and further the message of Pope John the Twenty Third on peace. They didn't get to see the Pope was very ill, I think, at that time. They didn't get to see him personally. It was one of his last general audiences, and Dorothy and some of the other women felt that at one point he paid them special attention. He said some something that seemed to really recognize that women from all around the world were here. Dorothy didn't like to fly in planes. And so she, she, I think, had gone over on a ship and came back on a ship. And I think there had been a lot of uh, maybe people going back and forth between Rome on that ship, and they would have mass and all. But uh, that's where they uh, heard the news that uh, Pope John the Twenty Third had died. Uh, the next time she, she went was in 1965, which was the last session. And one of the chief movers here in getting her there was Eileen Egan. And Eileen helped to organize an issue of the Catholic Worker on Peace. And uh, she and Dorothy went over with this issue. And they were met there uh, by James Douglas, who had written The Nonviolent Cross. And uh, Eileen and Jim Douglas and a number of others were going and talking to various bishops and giving them these copies, they brought thousands of copies so they could give each bishop a, a copy of the Catholic worker. And, uh, but Dorothy joined a group of women that were organized by Lanza del Vasto and his wife, Chanterelle. They were, uh, Lanza del Vasto was a student of Gandhi, a Frenchman, I think he may be in a Sicilian, but of some sort of noble background. And, uh, he had walked all the way 
from Italy to India to meet Gandhi. Been very taken with Gandhi. And Gandhi had said, no, you must go back to the West, you know, and teach the West on violence. So uh, Lanza de Vasto did come back and started a community in southern France. And they were um, a prayerful community. They made uh, um, their furniture. They wove their cloth. I met him a couple of times. He wore his beautiful homespun clothing, you know, and had a carved cross that he had carved and, and that sort of thing. And so uh, he and Chanterelle had called for a number of women from around the world to come to a convent in Rome, and they fasted in Rome for 10 days. And they were visited by a number of the council fathers during that, that period. The uh, patriarch from Lebanon came, and, and uh, they said they were doing a water fast. They said, oh, water is life. You know? So, uh, uh, and, and uh, Dorothy writes about some of the theologians and all that she heard during, d during that period. And I met a man once who had been a, uh, a Jesuit student at that time in Rome, and he talked about how going with Dorothy uh, once from, I'm not sure, nowhere, maybe somewhere at the Vatican, back to this convent where she was staying, and that every few feet she would stop to talk with somebody or, or uh, give a beggar something. He, this, this fellow was really impressed. He, could, he couldn't, he just, uh, this uh, sense of personalism and direct address that he, uh, well, the council did m make that uh, condemnation of, of nuclear war and also said uh, there should be an option for Catholic conscience, for conscience objection and Catholics ought to be able to apply for that. So those, those were very important things. But Dorothy was terribly supportive of all the other council documents. I mean, she had been working uh, with Don Virgil Michael uh, in the liturgical movement. He died soon, but he came to the Catholic Worker uh, before he died in 38. And she and Peter Moran had been out to Collegeville to, to visit him there. So uh, the liturgical reform and tying that in with Catholic social teaching was really important to her. We went, Kathleen and I, Kathleen's family is from St. Louis. And when we were going to St. Louis one time, she wanted us to make sure that we went to look up Monsignor Hellriegel, who had a wonderful parish in, I guess, North St. Louis or so, and uh, 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 had uh, like a tremendous children's choir and uh, uh, some sort of a dialogue mass and all. She wanted us to experience this sort of the, uh, liturgy that was, you know. So she was very much in favor with, uh, and, 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 you know, this, uh, the great document on religious freedom that the council published that I think. Uh, Paul VI had may have been one of the most important documents that came out of the council. Uh, and this sense of uh, um, the dignity of each person and that each person's uh, 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 choice and belief and practice and all those things that, that was so important for, for that to go back to the individual to, to decide. It, it wasn't like individual it wasn't for individualism. It was more a matter of sense of each person must develop integrity, real integrity in themselves. So that's, she saw all those things, I think, in those documents. You know. Does that help a little? Thank you. Oh, it's on now. OK, thanks. Um, I'm curious if you can speak to the decision-making process in the movement and in the House and what that looked like and if there was a consensus process that was used or if there were decisions that were made by Dorothy or a small group or um, if you have all any insights above. into that. All of the above and none of the above. Uh, <laughs> the anarchist. Uh, uh, aspect of the Catholic worker is often evident in the way decisions are made at, at, uh, at Catholic worker houses of hospitality that I'm familiar with in New York. You know. And um, uh, basically, uh, if there was something going on in the house, it was up, up to the people who had, that the, Dorothy felt that the people who came into the Catholic worker, uh, they had a good sense of who you should rely on and whose judgment you, you should rely on. And in that sense, that those were the people that sort of uh, were in charge and, and, and people came to. 
and she was certainly that, and this was one of her great uh, crosses in a sense, that she could hardly get away from this. Every time she came back from a long trip or whatever, everybody was besieging her with complaints about so-and-so, what are we going to do about this, we need more money, whatever it was, it all fell on her shoulders. In some ways, uh, then she would go travel to get away from some of this, you know. And she would write about things she had seen maybe here in Minnesota, and that would encourage people that they'd be published in the paper, and it would encourage people back at, at the house. Then she'd come home, and uh, uh, people were so delighted when she came. She had a certain sense of presence. I was in a place one time where she came in through like a back, and all of, all of a sudden, I don't think people had seen her. There was quiet in the place, you know. Some Some people have these uh, qualities, and, and uh, it's not like they have them all the time, but uh, sometimes th those things uh, do happen. So um, when we were there, by and large, um, the people who were in charge of the house, St. Joseph's house, were men. And she felt that was because most of the people coming into the house who had problems and there was a great deal of violence and all, uh, uh, were men coming into the house, and that that um, that that you you needed a, a strong man to do that. Um, sometimes the men who took that position were just off of the wall. You know, they had been bouncers in bars, and they continued to be bouncers at the Catholic worker door and throw people out or whatever. So then that had to be corrected. You know, and so a lot of the people who came around the Catholic worker did not believe in Catholic worker pacifism. You know. They'd been through a lot, and, and they were going to protect themselves. So that's, that's what you saw. Eventually, um, I think a lot of that changed. And uh, first of all, Dorothy was such a strong uh, image, uh, a feminine image, woman, uh, image of a woman in charge. And there had been certain farms where she had put uh, women in charge of the farm. And then gradually, this... Uh, a more democratic sense between men and women, I think, began to take place uh, 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 at the Catholic Worker. Um, Peter Moran was against meetings. He felt you should see the problem and then act on it. So Dorothy wasn't really into big meetings either. She followed a model, sometimes they would say, of a Benedictine abbot. She would try to listen to different people, even the lowliest person, in the rule of St. Benedict, the lowliest person is supposed to be heard too. So Dorothy would try to do that, and, and then from that coalesce a decision. She said that um, she was giving a conference at a college up in Westchester. It was a, something on feminism. And when she came to give her talk, Sally Kaneen wrote about this years later, um, uh, she talked basically about how the man who made the cook was the authority at the Catholic Worker House. Well, um, this didn't get much traction, this audience of uh, feminists. Dorothy was later made a member of the uh, um, Women's Hall of Fame and all, so there's, there's no denying her strength as a, as a, a woman. Um, but uh, Sally Kaneen went back because she, it's a, she wanted to hear the tape of this talk, of Dorothy talking about the authority of the cook. And um, she said she said she wanted to hear that because it was the thing that had impressed her most at the conference. And she went back, and that tape had been deleted. So th those things happen. But um, I think they do have more meetings now at the New York Catholic Worker Houses, in a sense, because there's not a Dorothy figure there. It is much more uh, collegial now than I think it was at one time. The problem with that can be, especially when you're editing a paper, is that Peter Morin said, everybody's paper is nobody's paper. And a paper has to have a point of view, you know. So that could be a problem. Um, you know, when I was working at Commonweal, we did have a hierarchy, a collegial, very collegial. But when push came to shove, somebody was going to have to make the decision, even if it meant that you might be offered a chance to write a contrary editorial that went against what the majority said. Anyway, it's, it's, a, it's a living, uh, moving being. <laughs>
Thank you very much.